In this video, I explain how the revolutionary IBM Master Clock Slave Clock automatic correction system works. You are looking at master clocks made by the International Time Recording Company, ultimately named IBM. They first introduced their master clock slave clock system in 1909. The earliest IBM clock dials were labeled International Time Recording Company, followed by being labeled International, and finally IBM. For simplicity, I am referring to everything as IBM. Slave clocks are connected via a pair of wires to the master clock, and every minute the master clock sends an electrical impulse to the slaves, advancing the hands one minute. When all is well, the slave clock time is exactly the same as the master clock time. However, these systems were dependent upon an uninterrupted electrical supply, and if electrical power is lost, the slave clocks fall behind the master clock time. Self-winding IBM master clock is spring-driven, so it will still run for hours during a power interruption. By 1924, IBM developed an automatic correction system. They termed their system the self-regulating system. This correction system was the first to be developed by any of the time system companies. This 1953 IBM master clock has the self-regulating feature and controls all of my IBM slave clocks. A close look at this master clock movement shows the self-regulating levers and contacts are mounted on the left of the master clock movement. A few IBM master clocks were also equipped with an accumulator. Let's start with an overview of the entire IBM master and slave clock correction process. The goal is for the master and the slave to show the exact same time. The master sends minute impulses on two separate lines, the A line or B line. Two different lines make it possible for the master to stop impulses to slaves that are fast or send extra impulses to slaves that are slow. The master correction process takes place in the last 10 minutes of each hour. The slave clock is not an independent timepiece. Slave hands are simply advanced one minute each time they receive an impulse from the master. This shows the slave wiring. The slave only accepts impulses on one line or the other. The AB switch directs impulses to the A line or the B line. Slave correction is at the slave clock's 59th minute. Here, a slow slave is advancing to the 59th minute. Fast slaves stalled at the 59th minute, and on-time slaves arrived at 59 at precisely master clock time. I know this sounds pretty complicated, but stick with me and I will explain. First, let's look at the master clock. All but the earliest IBM master clocks are equipped with a cam-activated contact that sends an impulse every minute to both wind the mainspring and advance the slave clocks. The slaves were connected to the master with a single pair of wires. This is a master with an early version of the self-regulating movement. The self-regulating movement required three additional contacts, and the slaves were connected to the master with three wires. This is the latest version of the self-regulating master movement. The master movement correction contacts are wired to transmit a minute impulse on the A line from the first to the 60th minute, and also a minute impulse on the B line from the first to the 50th minute, and an additional 17 impulses on the 59th minute via the A line. The earliest IBM slaves were connected to the master via a pair of wires and the hands were advanced one minute each time they were impulsed. If the power failed, the slave fell behind. This early version IBM three-wire slave is the first reliable self-correcting slave. Levers resting on the cam on the center shaft directs impulses either to the A line or the B line. 
This latest IBM Minute Impulse three-wire slave design proved to be superior to any slave of any company. It was introduced in the early 1930s. It is important to understand the operation of the IBM slave before discussing the correction feature. A rotor receives an impulse from the master and rotates. When the rotor returns, it moves a minute hand as the cam on the center shaft turns. Now comes the most significant part of the correction process. It is the slave that dictates the correction. At the 59th minute, the cam rotates, the lever drops, and the contact changes from A to B. You can see this happening from the side. Everything happens at 59. The design of the cam dictates the shifting of the AB switch. The 59th minute correction relies on shifting the contact from the A line to the B line. The slave stays on B from minutes 60 to 3 and shifts back to A on minutes 4 through 59. Clocks that were fast stalled at their 59th minute because they needed an impulse on the B. Clocks on time read 59 and need an impulse to move forward on the B. Clocks slow are still on A and will be advanced forward every two seconds until they reach 59 and switch to B. The master sends impulses at 60 minutes on A and B, but the slave will only accept the B impulse. By accepting this impulse, all clocks now agree the time is exactly on the hour. This is a typical IBM three-wire self-regulating slave clock. I would like you to watch as the correction is made for a clock that is eight minutes slow. The slave is receiving an impulse on the A line every two seconds. As the slave begins to catch up and finally reaches the 59th minute, the AB switch will switch to the B line and no more impulses will be accepted until the master clock sends a signal on the 60th minute on the B line. This master switch diagram shows the precise timing of the three switches. From the bottom, the B line stops at 4940 and makes at 5940. That means no B line impulses for 10 minutes. Fast slaves wait when they get to 59. The A line advance makes from 5910 to 5945. That means slow clocks will move forward a minute with each closure of the two second contact until they reach 59. Now how it looks on the real movement. Every minute the cam revolves dropping the lever closing the contact. This impulse keeps the mainspring wound and is the contact that advances the slaves each minute. The three correction contacts grow through their cycle of opening and closing every hour. But this only affects slaves if they are either fast or slow. When a contact is open, no impulses will travel through. When a contact is closed, it will carry an impulse. The stop switch opens the B line from 4940 to 5940. This is when slaves up to 10 minutes fast are held back at the 59th minute. Once a slave reaches 59, it switches to the B line. Fast slaves reach 59 early and stall. Slaves advance to the 60th minute via an impulse from the master on the now closed B line. Slave clocks that are from one to 17 minutes slow can be corrected with extra impulses on the A line when the advance contact closes. The advance contact is active between 59.10 and 59.45. The extra impulses are generated by the two-second contact. 
the slaves accept as many two-second impulses as needed to reach the 59th minute. At the slave's 59th minute, the AB switch changes the contact from A to B, so any additional A-line two-second impulses are not accepted. The slave will accept the next impulse from the master on the B-line. This will be exactly on the hour and the synchronization is now complete. This is the cam that opens and closes the correction contacts. Now watch the last 10 minutes of change in 10 seconds. I am closing with my version of a world clock that I made with IBM slave movements. These slave movements are amazingly reliable. Rarely missing a beat, but turn out to be a good way to display the self-regulating feature. I set several movements behind, some fast, so the self-regulating feature can be appreciated. This video shows how slaves that are behind are all advanced to the 59th minute. Slaves that were correct do not move, and finally, that slaves that were fast stalled at the 59th minute. The engineering behind this is remarkable. These electromechanical clock systems are approaching 100 years old and still operate flawlessly. I can just imagine how this correction feature must have been the best thing ever for installers and service people. All they had to do was get the slave to the correct hour and whether it was 10 minutes fast or 17 minutes slow, it would be correct at the next hour. This must have saved an inordinate amount of time. Thank you for watching. Uh, this video was much longer than I planned, but it's a really complex and brilliant system. I do have other videos available about electromechanical clocks, and they're not that long. Thanks again.